just want to take your the next hour or so to um, work through a, a theme that we have been sort of um, spent some time discussing within the market and within various communities around the migration, or let's call it the, the, the spread of the business analyst career into the business architecture discipline. Um, so I'm going to just touch on some context. Uh, I'm a, I, I do like to set a little bit of context in the beginning. Um, so we'll do a little bit of context and then go into um, sort of the who, where, what, why, when of how this all fits together. We have one or two uh, additional items coming in the future. So we do have an IIBA Professional Development Day happening in Melbourne for those of you that are in town. And it is recognized by the IIBA professional, it is endorsed by them. Um, for uh, future accreditation. So if there are any of you are available, I just you can get the link in the presentation when we send it out. Um, and then you can also get a, a discount on some courses on, on the back of that. We also have a, a webinar, I think next week already, talking about the value of the architecture practice development aspects. Just early heads up, um, just we have one or two uh, additional items coming in the future. So we do have an IIBA Professional Development Day happening in Melbourne for those of you that are in town. Um, what that basically means is we do an accelerated business architecture sort of um, mind dump over two morning sessions. Um, and it is recognized by the IIBA professional, it is endorsed by them um, for uh, future accreditation. So if there are any of you are available, I just you can get the link in the presentation when we send it out. Um, and then you can also get a, a, a discount on some uh, courses on, on the back of that. <coughs> we also have a, a webinar, I think next week already, talking about the value of the architecture practice. So watch this space. Uh, there's a few um, uh, events coming up. I'll, I'll refresh that at the end of the cycle as well. All right, so let's head into a little bit of the why space. And uh, for those of you that have heard me talk before, I always seem to land up at this little model. And just to reinforce a point that the more we um, advance in the industry, and especially with digital disruption, the more um, that we use and that we develop that becomes what we refer to as utility or foundation commodity. And really what makes us good architects, I'm referring to us as in the general, everyone on this call, is the ability for you to innovate, assemble and mix this utility layer that you've got. And you're all exposed to a vast number of tools and information and applications that you need to bring to bear on a problem uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and really what makes you good at your job is how well you can innovate, assemble and mix those aspects. And that applies for business in general as well. I mean, business have utilities and there's reference models and capability models that they would use to build a business. But really what gives them differentiating capabilities is, is how they innovate and assemble the mix of the underlying blocks of their organization. And the reason I sort of focus on this is that um, I often refer to this knowledge funnel because I think there's a lot of bearing upon uh, our discipline because we are ultimately problem solvers. So whether you're a business architect or a business analyst or whatever title you wear, you're actually a problem solver. And what that means is we have to take stuff from the unresolved business challenges space, this mystery world, and we have to try and move it through this knowledge funnel to arrive into this sort of algorithm or codification in business. And when I say codification, I mean all the process models, requirements, all the techniques that most of us have sort of grown up with in BPMN and UML, and the requirement specifications, that's all down there in the bottom in that algorithm space. And over time, as you have done this and delivered on your various projects and, and sites, you would have developed what we refer to as heuristics. These are rules of thumb. These are quick little um, rules which allow you to look at a problem space and, and effectively be able to solve it or, or, or have, an, have an idea of what the solution would be without necessarily going right through an exhaustive exercise. An interesting study we've done is that a lot of people, as they travel an entire journey to solve a problem, they've already solved the problem from sort of the first 10% of that journey time span. And they use the other 80 to 90% just to try and ratify their decision because they've built this set of decision-making rules that they work with. And, and really, it's those rules which allow you to mix your business more effectively. It's those rules which will allow you as an analyst or an architect to be able to mix the underlying utility layer of your business 
far more effectively. And what we've seen, especially in a sort of article published by um, the Harvard Business Review around the coherence premium, is that those organizations that can mix their underlying assets the most effectively, and especially at a capabilities level, which is a capability coherence score, um, are the ones that can actually produce a better bottom line. And when I talk about coherence, um, I'm just talking about the ability to get the organization to execute as a whole. And you know, that most organizations we go into are extremely fragmented. Um, and you know, this research has shown, well, if, if there is a way, and there is a way, which is a capability-based mechanism, that we can get all of my capabilities in the organization to pull together and work together as a system whole, then there's, there's a value in, on, on the back of that. And really, in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to look at designing business models that give us great coherence. Um, and when I talk about coherence, I often refer to how we as EA define a business model. And that's it there on the left there. And really, that's just a collection of concepts sort of in, in a layered structure in which I have a market that I'm operating in and I deliver products and services to that market and I have an operating model or the engine that produces it. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get synergy and coherence between all of those aspects of my business so that I can produce the value that I'm looking for. And I'm going to touch on some value aspects just now and you can see what's in the gap that exists between what we see as value versus how we actually produce value. And then my final one in the sort of space here just to talk around the, the coherency and how we get it, is, is this balance of thinking types. Now, you know, there's lots of disagreement around left and right brain thinking and all the rest of it. I, I tend to like it because I see it at work all around me. But really what we've got here is different skill sets required to understand the business and to be able to design it more effectively. And most of us are used to this sort of left brain space, which is the analytical thinking area. And that's that robust, repeatable, and, and, and reliable types of processes. Um, and those are all the types of tools that we use within that space in order to produce that reliability. Because we want to be able to exploit and sweat the processes that we've designed within the organization. This is on the right-hand side, which is goal is more exploration and to, to produce outcomes that meet an objective. So sort of these two worlds that, that we need to be able to bring together. <clears throat> and in the middle there is these heuristics that I keep referring to, and that's, that's often the space that we refer to as the business architecture space. Um, some schools of thought refer to that as the design thinking space, in which it's bringing these two worlds together. Whatever you want to call it is really ultimately, we've, we've coined the term enterprise design, in which we take business architecture and we merge it with design thinking, and we've got this concept called enterprise design. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to merge these two sort of problem spaces of exploitation and exploration. And that then relates to the types of skills that we want to be able to address in this discipline, in the discipline of business analysis and, and business architecture. And what we want to try and do, and this is a graph which I often use, especially when we get to sort of opportunities and solutions phase, especially when we start to try and understand at a business level what should we do with what capabilities within our organization. And complexity versus um, strategic importance. And really what this is, is we've got the top right section here, which is all that chaos space. It's the mystery area. And what we have to do effectively, we have to move our um, problem space through this knowledge funnel as quickly as possible. And that, I believe, is the discipline of the BA. And I'm going to use the term BA to refer to both of us, sort of the business analyst and the business architect. Um, and the job of the BA is to try and accelerate those problem areas through that knowledge funnel to get to more repeatable, reliable processes in the bottom right quadrant, which is still valuable in differentiating. And then ultimately, to, to once you've sweated those to the maximum, to squeeze them down into the automation space, which is the bottom left, and more of your ERP type automation functions. And ultimately, you can outsource on the top on the top left. And the challenge here is not necessarily that we don't, well, it is a challenge to try and move those problems through that knowledge funnel more effectively and more efficiently because we're, we're, we're often seen as, a, as a, a delayer, for lack of a better word, 
an incumbent to moving those problems um, down into the delivery space because we're looking too broad or, or we're asking challenging questions around the system impact of, of some of the decisions that the executives are making. And part of the challenge is, if you look at this graph, it's the same graph, but, but really what we're seeing, and this is due to the disruptive factors that are occurring in the industry, is so that that's sort of top right quadrant, let's rephrase it, but the bottom left quadrant is actually getting bigger. So a lot of the things that you used to differentiate us as individuals and as businesses are becoming industrial, they're becoming commodity. You know, I can now go and get a reference model for pretty much any business that I want to. Um, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I can find it on the internet. I can take a lot of process models that are freely available I can look at application landscapes that are freely available and a lot of the stuff's even automated in the cloud. So that sort of bottom left space is actually getting quite big. And it's the top right space, and this is the sort of question, is that top right space getting bigger or is it actually getting more frenetic, is it getting squeezed, uh, in which the concept of innovation, and being able to innovate better and faster is, is becoming more and more pressurized as that sort of utility space gets bigger and bigger some fascinating economic models that sort of talk to the space and the impact it's having on our industry. But you see the, the challenge is if that, if that space is actually getting smaller, it puts more of a burden upon us as the individuals who have to take that innovation chaos and push it through that knowledge funnel as effectively as possible. And, and really that, that speaks to the, well, well, whose responsibility is this? Who must take on this type of role within an organization? Um, and this is from a model that, that we produced for one of the sort of tier one banks. And, and, and having a look at it, so it's the same sort of business model I introduced you to earlier. And, and we see ownership up at the top within the market products and services layer. We see ownership down the bottom, specifically within data applications and technology often sitting underneath the CIO. But in the middle there, there's this sort of vague understanding of well, who has ownership of the actual capabilities um, process, processes, core value chains, cross-functional capabilities, all of those aspects of the business. And often there's no defined individuals or team that operate within that space. So there's a tremendous opportunity to build a capability within that area of the organization. You just have to be able to position the value correctly to your stakeholders. And then probably something slightly more ambitious would be the, um, the lack of individuals that kind of sit in the blue area, which is these cross-functional, these cross-discipline types, types of individuals that can link from market down to products and services right down to operating model. And very rarely, I'll be honest with you, do we find individuals that actually sit within that space, especially because of the functional nature of organizations and performance models that they use. And, and, and I think that there's, and there's also an opportunity there for us to play. We just need to be able to build the skill and capability to start to First, deal with that gray area, the business architecture mandate, and then after that, start to focus on all the strategic stuff and the coherence-based disciplines that sit on the right-hand side. And I think one of the challenges in this space, and you probably all have the, the same issue, is it's just this plethora of frameworks. And this is the commodity space. A lot of our thinking has been cascaded down and frameworks have been developed, methods have been developed, and they all really are great value items for helping in that utility layer, for building standardization, standard processes, standard ways of defining outputs. These things are all quite good. Unfortunately, our stakeholder sitting in the middle is, is sort of inundated with every mean, all different framework, every individual with some new mechanism that they want to use to help this particular stakeholder. And, and ultimately, well, who's in charge of that relationship with that stakeholder? And we've seen a variety of operating models where, you know, they would put a business representative or even a technical representative that abstract technical people away from the business people and put a, 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 a business rep that sits in between them to try and manage that relationship. Which is a telling in itself and that or through all of these frameworks, and, and means and mechanisms, we don't actually have a decent enough language to be able to interact with our stakeholders, um, and therefore requiring a translator to sort of sit in between us and them, um, so to speak. So there's an opportunity for a discipline to play within that space um, of that relationship management and, and, and far more outcome-focused, design-focused than necessarily 
architecture focused, and I'll explain that a little later. And really what that's done is, I mean, there's, there's a lot of discipline confusion out there. I mean, look at the different terms that, that just we use, and I'm sure each of you has a variety of other roles that you might be able to call upon when you look at your, 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 your space. From the enterprise design space, the product and service business, architecture business, and you can see the tremendous amount of overlap that sits across the planning, delivery, and operating aspects of the business. And when trying to deal with some of these issues, um, one of the sort of key items that I normally like to call out is we often tend to focus on our own discipline. We focus internally and we build an internal capability. We build a services model and a product model of how we deliver services to the customer or business stakeholder. But often I find that the problems arise not necessarily on with the interaction of your own discipline to the stakeholder, but when all the disciplines are trying to interact with the same stakeholder. And you're all coming with different messages because you all haven't got an understanding of how each of you fits together and how each discipline bolts together to achieve a coherent outcome. So one of the first things that needs to occur is to sort out the interrelationship and engagement models and service models that exist between these disciplines so that it's, it's a far more streamlined process as your business executives and stakeholders start to interact with you. And one of those areas, obviously, is now the business analysis and business architecture space. Now, what we have here is the, a diagram from Babok, uh, where we've looked at sort of the competencies from foundational to advanced and across sort of a detail to a big picture focus. And there's the traditional Babok-based career path, let's call it that, the roles that exist from an entry-level business analyst right up to this advanced generalist business analyst. And you can see in there you've got the business architect, you've got the strategic business analyst, and a few other roles that play within that space. And running next to that is the business architecture space. And that's really where, um, this is our own model, by the way. It's not an industry standard yet because the discipline is still in a state of flux. But slightly more bigger picture, but ultimately as we move up the curve, getting to a point where the principal business architect um, is really what the Babok refers to as a as a as a business architect, um, and also as you go even higher than that, the concept of the strategic architect, strategic business analyst, and really as we get up into a master business architect and distinguished business architect, those disciplines tend to operate at the same level. So you can see there's a there's a merging of these disciplines, so to speak, as you kind of get up into the advanced and big picture view of an organisation. And we see that across the different models that are developed as well. So here is sort of a view of the different model types across in the use. And um, if we overlay some of those roles over this, you can see we've got from the strategic business analyst right down to the, uh, the senior business analyst. And you can see we drop in the business analyst. And that's where the business architect will traditionally operate. Okay, I'm just waiting for the screen rendering to catch up. There we go. Okay. And what you can see here, especially in the process function information side, there's actually a little bit of overlap that's occurring. Um, and that's often, you can see, even if I overlay the enterprise architect and then the solution architect over that space, there's a lot of noise around the disciplines and how they actually fit together and who has ownership of what and ultimately who speaks to the end stakeholder. And really that space there in the middle is where we see a lot of noise. So there's a lot of overlap kind of within this process function information, especially conceptual and logical layers. Um, and that's a bit of role confusion within that space. And I'll elaborate a little further on how we can deal with that. Just looking at the current business analysis career path, um, I've sat with a few a number of business analysts over the years and try to get an understanding of their career path. Um, and you've got sort of two paths that you can take as a business analyst. You can continue the the ideal path, um, or actually what we refer to as ideal, some of you might refer to another path as ideal, as you go up from a senior BA, sort of an entry level BA up to a senior BA, and then ultimately to move up into a strategic business analyst, or what we've called it a strategic business architect. But we see that a lot of BAs, you know, sort of midway up the curve there as they intermediate to senior, they, do, they move off into more of a project uh, project manager role, um, project lead, program lead, business relationship manager role, so far more delivery focused. Um, and I suspect that that is a lot to do with the opportunities up at that senior level. Um, 
is what we have here is a delivering path um, that is a green one on the bottom left. And then we have the managing path, which is kind of like the next step in the career. But then there's also this planning path, which is this thought leadership in terms of innovation, business models, and different business mixes. Now, we've called that space the architecture space, but that's also the, the one of the paths that the business analyst needs to take. And I think that, yes, there is lack of opportunity, but we, we've already seen in that uh, business model that I showed you that there is a lack of ownership in the middle there. And, and really it's, well, can we um, adapt the outcomes of, of what the models that we deliver to be able to open up opportunities within that space? And I'm going to take you through a number of sort of quick cheap that can help you start to open up some of those opportunities. But that's ultimately what you want to do if you love business and you like to engineer businesses, which most of us do. And that's the skill that we have. And, and, and we know that we can't always operate in the utility layer. We've got to operate up in that mix layer. And that's that sort of blue section there. You've got to be able to differentiate yourself from the crowd. And you've got to be able to figure out, well, how can I move up into that space? And how can I open up the right opportunities within that space? So let's look at what needs to be done in order to do that. And um, I, I took a stab at a couple of the uh, these sort of areas where um, or what's causing this lack of opportunity. Um, and this roof really refers to the sort of left brain, right brain aspect as well. And ultimately, because um, reliability is what is really the main driver in organizations because it's low risk. So because we, we, business individuals are going to make decisions a lot or more often than not based upon risk. Um, and lower risk areas are towards the left, they are towards the analytical mode, or towards where I can create highly repeatable processes that I can predict and I know the outcome. Um, and we've seen this in the industry before where we've built advanced models that, that don't cater for predictive left or non-deterministic problem spaces like share trading. And, Business people are reluctant to invest in software platforms that tell them a different answer each time because they're replicating actually what happens in life because we don't know what's going to happen. You know, some of you couldn't connect to the call, you wouldn't have been on the call, and something could have distracted you. So there's, there's things which you can't cater for in the software layer. And even when you do build that into software, um, business people don't like it because it's not reliable um, and it's not giving them the consistency that they're looking for. So it's all about risk. Uh, there's also utility driven. Uh, the business or the BA disciplines are often seen as utility focused and that they are the people that must crank out within that reliability space. They must produce the building blocks. Somebody else must stitch those building blocks together. More often than not, delivery driven is, is a sort of the key incumbent I see is that a lot of good business, or I'm going to call them BAs as I said, a lot of good BAs find themselves getting pulled into the delivery space, which ultimately leads them down that path of project management. And I'm, I'm just now helping a bank at the moment trying to pull its BA team out of the delivery side of business and back up into the planning space because they're really good at what they do and they really understand the business well. And therefore they can solve problems even down in that delivery space. But they're losing the value and therefore they're closing that opportunity gap at the top to begin to operate up at that strategic level because they're getting too focused on delivery. Ultimately, Organizational driven, right? Um, there's less room at the top for those types of initiatives. A lot of business people believe that they should operate in that level. And to a certain extent, I think there is, there is some merit to that where I believe that business people actually need to understand the discipline of business architecture, understand the tools and techniques of business analysis. Um, and it does beg the question that, well, if business people learn those skills, what room is there for the BA as a role definition? And it's going to be interesting to see that play out in the industry. But really organizational driven, you know, there might be not be opportunities that sit at the top there, and we'll see how we can open this up with some tips. Uh, performance driven, once again, focused on reliability. And then also, I won't read to the rest of them, just focus on the mandate piece. Your mandate could actually be quite low. Um, and this is what I mean by a mandate. And this is the curve that we predominantly use in a lot of our engagements. And it's really, what is the mandate of the architecture discipline? Um, and I'm not, let's call it the BA discipline. Right. The mandate, is it to improve project performance? Is it to improve enterprise-wide investment performance? Let me give you some examples. So improving project performance is 
well, we need an HR solution um, implemented within our organization. Improve enterprise-wide investment performance. As well, you know, how is my investment portfolio looking um, across all of my projects? And this might be across a major banking transformation exercise. Um, the C is improving business performance, and that might be, well, I'm losing 20 million uh, a quarter across my value chain. You know, find out why and fix it. You know, find better mixes that can help me be more efficient and more effective. Uh, up to D, which is improving product and service performance. And that's related to product architecture and creating a more efficient sweating of my product landscape, my service landscape, better bouquets, cross-selling, upselling, those types of challenges. And moving right up into the sort of E phase, which is the market performance. And you can see this is quite well aligned to that business model I introduced you to. Mm -hmm. And this is all about uh, improving shareholder value, uh, value models, performance models, reducing cost to income ratios, those types of challenges. I mean, just using that type of language, you can see the frameworks and the language that you need. And the difference between operating at, at an E stage versus an A stage is quite, quite difficult, or rather quite different. But I see the BA discipline as operating right across that spectrum and dealing with all of those areas. We just want to be able to open up that opportunity on the top right. So this is the sort of how that mandate affects the different roles. Um, and uh, this is in alignment to some of the language in DABOC, which often refers to the business improvement space, um, kind of sitting, and we've positioned it onto this mandate curve. This is just our view, by the way. And then there's a business transition space, which is all about realigning the projects and the investment portfolio and being able to figure out, are we investing money in the right places? And then kind of moving up into the enterprise planning and performance space, which is dealing with the sort of CD in the in East um, area. And you, you can see from this diagram, the different types of skills that we would that we would use and different tools that we would use across the spectrum. Um, and from business analysis and performance recommendation improvements, some of the traditional business analysis and requirements analysis occurring down at the bottom. And not to say that requirements analysis, by the way, doesn't occur right up the spectrum. I'm not saying it just occurs within that space. You'll find that the tools and techniques you learn now um, uh, even as a junior BA, you're going to be able to apply this right up this curve. They don't, you don't leave them behind, um, so you carry them with you. So up into the program and portfolio management transitionary space, and there's that other sort of branch of the BA career that you saw. And then up into the more sort of quantitative product strategy design thinking space, into shareholder value space, value maps. And these are all the types of models and tree, um, tools that you would use as you would sort of move up that mandate curve. Um, and for those of you that are, uh, are aware of Sophia, that's the skills framework for the information age. Um, so there are some business analysis. Business analysis is within Sophia, but this enterprise planning and performance space, uh, that is one skill set that doesn't exist within the, the top area. Um, and a lot of people look at it and say, well, Craig, that's just an MBA. Well, to a certain extent, yes, there are a lot of the skills that you do up in that top section you would learn in the MBA. In fact, in, on the back of some of our uh, business architecture courses, when we've actually had MBA students in the class, we've, actually, we've had feedback like, well, I've been taught all of the MBA tools, now I finally know how to use them. And because we, we teach a way to stitch all of those pieces together in, a, in, in, in an actual problem space to deal with problems that they're having on a day-to-day -day basis um, within their various roles. And then you can see I've, what I've also done here is I've overlaid the, the different roles from a business analyst and a business architect uh, onto that mandate curve as well. Now, let's deal with a few tips around um, being able to move, move up this curve. Um, and then I'll accelerate a bit of that. I guess we're at 8.30, good. So, one of the things that I often see as a, a large error in these spaces is misalignment to what I refer to as operating rhythms. And your organization has got a pattern that it follows around how often the executives meet, how often the exco meets, how often the board meets, how often all of the executive decision-making groups meet, and um, they have a planning process of when information needs to be in for budgeting purposes and planning, et cetera, et cetera. And surprisingly, I often find that the outputs of an analysis, an architecture exercise, are often not aligned 
with the decision making, the planning cycles within the organization. And information that is relevant really only for a management level, mid-management level group is delivered up at a board level and it's completely irrelevant to the decisions that the board individuals need to make. So you have to align the outputs that you're actually producing with the organizational rules of the organization, so of the business. So obviously, you know, the best way to do it is to get your act together at the bottom, being able to produce the insights required up at just the mid-management level, and then you can start to tackle the, the exco groups, and you can start to tackle the board and figure out what needs to be delivered for those particular types of individuals. So alignment with your operating model is quite key. And we see that within this little study that we did, we did internally, which really looked at the change that's occurring in the market. Now, this word disruption is now commonplace. Everybody's heard it and should hopefully have an understanding of what, it, what it's doing for you and your career and also the businesses you're working in. And what the disruption, especially digital disruption, is doing is changing a whole series of life cycles. So you're talking about an organizational rhythm. Well, even the rhythms of your, your organization are changing. And I referred to the complexity versus value matrix earlier on, in which that space of innovation is getting smaller and smaller and under more and more pressure. And it's resulting in a need to not just reboot products according to the traditional 4P product life cycle, but in actual fact reinvent your business model a lot more frequently. And ultimately reinvent your, your brand and your, and your enterprise a lot more frequently. So we're now hearing terms of business model innovation. And Alex Osterwalder has said that, you know, a business model is like a, a tub of yogurt. You know, it goes off after a, a time period. So you need to keep reinventing it. And that's really what we see a lot of organizations now focusing their efforts on how can they reinvent their business model at a value system level, exploiting not just their own value chain, but the broader value system that they operate in. Um, and those are some of the techniques that we teach within our business architecture course. And how do we use things like the, the business model canvas and value system modeling and value chain modeling to be able to deal with some of those disruptive factors and then how can we use that as input into the strategic management process so that I can begin to open up opportunities um, for, for business architecture going forward. Um, also just one of the strategies is provide structural insight and this is sort of one of the areas where we'd like to focus on on the top part of that mandate curve is to get you to the, have the ability to be able to provide insights um, into the types of strategic business models that you can actually use. So not just requirements analysis, not just trying to understand how to model a business, but actually taking um, value, taking business motivation, and playing those out and using the business architecture techniques into a series of um, business models and then ultimately scoring those business models to show the value of each of those models and how you stitch together the capabilities within that space to see, well, which is which can I achieve in the least amount of time and give me the most value. Um, and there's, there are techniques that you can use to do that specifically in the capability-based planning space. Um, and what that does is give input into the strategic team around which business model actually works more effectively. And I can overlay um, current investment, maturity, in-flight projects, strategic value, and a variety of, of those types of, of questions that I can overlay over business models that I develop in order to realign and design for, for different types of business models. This I've spoken to, um, well, just a tip here is that if you're going to look at trying to get your disciplines to work together, what we've seen is quite an effective approach is to build a team that actually brings together all of the disciplines that are trying to look horizontally across the organization. Because guess what, it's not just IT that wants to try and stitch it all together because they've got a, a platform that they need to operate. It's the change managers who want to look right across and see the impact of a major transformation across all of the staff. It's the finance guys who want to do business insights and reporting across the entire investment slate to, to provide input into um, product profitability and customer profitability and the engine that's producing the profitability. Um, it's the project managers who want to look at project port um, program and portfolio management. You know, it, it's the business improvement and process people. They all are trying to look horizontally across the entire organization. And creating a team where these individuals and disciplines are all together, and calling it whatever you want, enterprise planning team or integrated business planning, is a good step. And I've seen it work quite effectively in some organizations. And specifically because there's a, there's a particular 
sort of route that you take as you move up this curve. So let's just to start at the bottom of the curve. So traditionally, we, we, we've got the strategic language. You know, the executives, they'll go off to a strategy off site somewhere and they'll, they'll arrive at a series of initiatives. Well, really what happens is they use a whole bunch of strategic tools to come up with strategic themes and on the back of that produce a series of initiatives. They then assign those initiatives over to um, various stakeholders um, and those stakeholders are now responsible for delivering against those initiatives. And often we find that fragmentation has already begun at this level. And each individual who is in charge of a different segment, they will go ahead and produce their own business models and fragmentation. And later on, we'll, architects will try and come in and create a combined business model to try and at least see if there's some coherency that they can get out of this. And that's normally when we have a simpler view that normally when the business architecture discipline tends to be sitting under PMO, the project and portfolio management. So, you know, strategic planning has a bunch of initiatives, gives it to PMO, PMO comes along later to, and says, oh, we need this architecture discipline somewhere to, to bring, to bring um, coherency and, and, and alignment across all of the programs. And, I, and, and I'm, that model I don't, don't think works well. Uh, I think that the point of architecture is to produce a roadmap and government roadmap, the one that is designed for coherency and designed for value, whereas the project manager often looks at time, resource, cost, the business architect looks at the business model. And then the lens gives the stakeholders the business lens to look through a portfolio. And then so the next step as we move up that curve would be to rather build a unified business model. In other words, how can we stitch together those capabilities to produce the outcomes we're looking for? So what capabilities do I need for those themes? and then producing a roadmap on the back of that business model, a coherent roadmap around all of the different synergies that exist across my organization, how they can be bolted together and effectively produce the programs on the back of that. And the way that that looks is business architecture moves above that space. And then the business analysis, you can see the, the scope of the business analysis discipline, which is, and remember, I'm saying that business architecture is part of the business analysis discipline in the graph I introduced previously. But let's just create the separation for them now. The business analysis teams would, would kind of stretch a little now across into the portfolio and project management in line with the uh, sort of traditional move into the uh, program and project management space uh, highlighted in DABOC. But what this means now is that I design a business first and then I look at the effects of how am I going to deliver it through my program and project teams. Sort of the next stage of that would be to extend the business architecture discipline up into the business planning space. And what this really means is that example I referred to previously, in which we have the ability to look at the outcomes that a, a business is looking for and produce business model scenarios, um, strategic scenarios, if you're going to call them, this is where we use a canvas and those types of tools. And being able to play out what each of those business model scenarios could look like for the business right down to a possibility of an implementation level, but being able to do that quickly and efficiently and not in an eight-month exercise. And you need to build a team that can produce that, those types of outputs you know, within you know, six to eight weeks. So looking at all the different business models, all the different options, in six to eight weeks, we have a view of which, which of those are the easiest to achieve and can produce the greatest return for us um, and we don't have to do a large amount of change within the organization. So doability, um, my competency to, to deliver it, the complexity for me to execute against, all of those types of things in which we're now looking at sort of realigning an entire business model. And that really moves this business architecture space up into this sort of top area here of the strategic planning. And then ultimately our dream is to move it here into this enterprise design space. And the way we see enterprise design is where we've now merged, we've created a merging between um, the innovative right brain intuitive aspects of the business and the highly analytical aspect. And we're actually seeing this in a variety of disciplines and some of you might have already picked this up where marketing, for example, is becoming less intu intuition driven, it's becoming now more analytical driven through all the data insights that you can get through big data. So you know, there you're seeing a merging occurring of what used to be highly intuitive and now you know, the highly analytical aspects of the meeting in the middle there as we begin to understand behavioral patterns and customer value versus organizational value and how to align those aspects. And that's really what we call the enterprise design space. How can we bring design thinking and business architecture thinking together into this concept called enterprise design? 
All right, next strategy. Uh, this is to piggyback off an enterprise performance management approach. Now, r really, the one, the, one of the highest values, I think, that we can give to a business is, is to give them alignment. But in actual fact, when you actually lift the bonnet and you have a look at the things that you've got to align, you just realize how much is broken in there um, and how much needs to be architected. And, and I often find that we tend to focus on the wrong place. Um, and we don't focus on aspects of what is value. We don't see what parts of the organization are, or what is value, how it can produce value, and how it can measure it. And then we don't align the engine that produces that value. We don't align it directly to the value that we're actually looking to achieve. And that's really what this model is trying to say. Well, we want to be able to get linkage between the value reporting bits on the left and the performance reporting bits on the bottom. But in order to do that, I have to understand strategic business objectives represented through critical success factors. I have to understand my key business flows. I have to build and align key performance indicators. And I have to align that to my um, critical success factors. And that's starting to align a performance model to a value model in my organization. But even more importantly, and I like this model from a book on real world BPM in the SAP environment, um, because it talks about uh, aligning the process, which is, in other words, how we deliver that value um, to the key performance indicators. Um, and, and ultimately, what I've added in there is some of the data quality bits that you can put in as well. And what that means is that you're actually able to design the processes to deliver that value. Um, and we, we look at those processes as the ones that sit inside what we refer to the cross-functional capability. But that alignment across value and performance model is really off, we often see what's missing. I mean, I can go into an organization, and this little circle here, often um, we, we, we work on these different value, and not value drivers, it's called value aspects uh, in silos. Um, I probably say that 80% of organizations that I walk into don't actually know what value is within their organization. And I say that because it, it has to be cohesive. One part of the retail part of the business can see they're pretty clear on what value is, but then they might have a digital part of the difference um, business or a corporate part of the, um, the business. And these value drivers are actually completely different and in conflict and cannibalizing each other's marketplaces. That is not a coherent business. Um, and it's because I don't have an understanding of how as a business as a whole it can produce value. And if they don't have that understanding, Stitching together utility layers and all the blocks underneath it is going to be very, very difficult for us as architects. So, so there's, a, there's a key piece up in that what is value um, that has to be defined. And strategic business architecture can help them identify and document what that needs to look like. But then ultimately, the traditional problem is, well, how do we actually produce that value? Um, and we produce it through our technology. We produce it through our people. We produce it through our processes. Well, guess what? There's your capabilities. Uh, and it's your people, process, and capabilities with information that produce the value that, uh, and the outcome that needs to be delivered. We're pretty good at measuring stuff, but often the measurement of the stuff isn't aligned to what we see as the actual value. <coughs> One other tip which I really think works well and we've seen some good traction is get, get out of the office and start co-designing with your stakeholders. And there's some really good material out there that you can use. It's all Creative Commons. We've used empathy maps and VP canvases to you know, design architectural practices. Um, and they allow you to basically get in the head of your customer. And not just your internal customer, but the actual customer on the street. Um, and get an understanding of how can your services actually benefit those particular individuals. So start to use some of these tools and techniques as you draw nearer and nearer to your customers. Um, support the investment planning cycle and cohesion of programs. And this is actually some of the, the bread and butter you of the architecture discipline and kind of hovers on the point of that little bridge between a senior BA and a project manager. And, and this really talks about trying to understand across a program of work where is loss of cohesion existing? How can we realign a strategic portfolio? How can we realign CapEx and OpEx conflicts that are existing across the business uh, um, to be able to um, create more coherency and to be able to drive up more value through my project landscape? And often we do this when the first scenario has occurred, the strategy team's gone away, produced a strategy, given it to PMO to execute. PMO then executes it in a fairly fragmented way, looking at um, time, cost, and effort. 
and uh, often not necessarily through a business lens. And you know, in in partnering, and I say that in strong terms because you must partner with PMO. They're often the teeth for you to get and open up the opportunities at the top. And partnering with them will give them a great lens, a business lens into their project space, so they can see where where fragmentations occurring across the project landscape. I mean, one of these examples here, you know, there were 77 programs trying to make one make changes to one capability within the organization. I mean, talk about fragmentation. How many meetings is that? How many emails is that? How many phone calls is that between all of those, those different individuals? Next tip is uh, choosing an architecture sponsor. Um, you can see here that there's actually some interesting metrics that have come out of InfoCheck um, around what makes an, ar an architecture successful. And it's actually <coughs> excuse me, giving responsibility for the outcomes to an external person. I don't say this because we're an external consultant, that sounds a little one-sided, but the research I thought was quite interesting because those individuals are removed from the politics and are often outcome focused and need, need to be able to solve a particular problem. This research shows that that if there's an external consultant responsible for business architecture, um, that the outcome of it is actually more effective uh, in the success of the actual function, um, as opposed to, um, you know, for example, some of the uh, somebody integrating multiple departments together. So uh, you know you can look for those individuals, and you can see that that's actually more successful than putting a highly placed executive in place of that. Um, um, that function. So you can see the sort of top two there, you've got the highly placed executive and you've got the external consultant. So choose the person wisely for who you want to start one of these teams, especially one of those teams where you're merging all the different disciplines together. All right, the other one is you know, improving your speed through the knowledge funnel. I think I've spoken quite a bit on this, um, but really you know, the, the job of a BA is to get that mystery down to the algorithm as quick as possible. And if you don't have the means, the methods, the techniques to be able to do that, then you, those are things that you need to develop as a practice and as an individual. How can I understand that problem space more effectively um, and be able to identify the key heuristics and rules of thumb so I can get it down into that algorithm space quicker, better, faster? This one here is all about um, looking at the different roles. You can see there I've, uh, I've overlaid the roles across the strategic importance versus complexity graph. And I've taken a process complexity lens here. And you can see the strategic business architect sort of top right. And remember what you're trying to do is a knowledge funnel. You're trying to sort of push down from that complexity space down into the repeatable processes at the bottom right and ultimately into some automation on the bottom left. Um, and, and you can see the different roles and where they could be in, involved in that cycle. Once again, not to say that I don't have a, a business analyst, a title of a business analyst, operating across that spectrum. This is just our view of, of those roles and how we've overlaid them across, um, across that life cycle uh, um, through the knowledge funnel, purely based upon the skill sets that each of them deliver. Um, this is something that we teach in one of our business architecture courses. and following what's called a concerns-based view. And we teach you how to do through simple models. Uh, and it has to be simple for stakeholders. Answer a variety of questions. So if we take a capability model, all right, and we overlay strategic importance of it by looking at business model motivation, we, we, we get to understand what is important to the business. Okay? If we then use a, a maturity model, especially a maturity model that looks at your maturity to produce certain outcomes, we then start to look at the strengths and weaknesses in our business and ability to produce those outcomes. And down to the bottom here is the business capability model. We now look at in-flight projects um, and where's my investment currently going. And then the bottom left there is all about um, tactical and political pressures. So you can see there are individual questions that I can answer purely by overlaying certain information over a single business model, a single representation of my business across the organization. But the true value also comes in, in which I start when I start to mix these views. And there's a variety of ways that you can mix them. So, for example, if I mix a strategic overlay with maturity, I can now have an understanding of am I able to achieve my strategy? Uh, if I mix maturity with in-flight projects, I can have a look and see am I over uh, or understanding in order to uplift that maturity? So, am I working on projects that I shouldn't even be working on because I have the right level of maturity? Now, even the ones in the middle, there is lack of maturity causing tactical flaws. Um, 
failures or tactical issues is my current investment aligned to my strategy. You can see as you mix these views in different ways, you can now begin to answer different questions. And I love that moment when we put these up on a board for our, our business stakeholders and there's this aha moment. And you kind of stand back, you let the architecture tell the story. And you stand back and then they kind of say, oh, hold on, why are we investing over, hold on, why is this red over here when we, 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 we've just spent you know, $10 million on it? I don't understand why we've got these political pressures when we, 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 we these aren't, this isn't even a strategic focus for us. And it's good to see that. You see them starting to ask those questions. That means you've kind of hit the nail on the head by producing insight into the business, especially across um, current investment portfolio. And I see I'm low on time, so I'm going to finish off on these next three. Okay. Because I think this one's quite important. And big problem within the BA discipline is leveling. How do I level capabilities? Well, what's a value chain? What's a value stream? Where do capabilities come in? What are the cross-functional groupings of capabilities? How does it all sort of fit together? And I think that having a clear understanding of what these levels are will also give you a clear understanding of what you can deliver to which stakeholders. So if you align these models to your performance model and your value model, you can align it to the organizational rhythms I spoke about previously, which means that I know what levels I need to use to deliver what outcomes for which stakeholders within the business. So it's important that you have an understanding of this. And for those of you that are familiar with architectural language, there's a concept called architecture partitioning. And architecture partitioning model is always broken in an organization because I often see models all over the place and they talk to a variety of different stakeholders. Whereas in actual fact, you should have a strategic architecture. And that strategic architecture gets broken up into segment architecture and capability architectures. And your depth is, is in the, is in the um, subject matter space. So in designing an architecture partitioning model helps you create alignment at a strategic level and across your segments and all of those pieces. Um, so something that you want to consider, not something that I can go through in this particular case, but if you have a look at TOGAF, we'll give you some ideas. TOGAF is the open group architecture framework for those of you that are unaware. Also, the next, next sort of tip um, is to always tie models into existing strategic planning artifacts. And we, we often make the mistake of a not invented here syndrome and try and go into the strategic space and reinvent it all and come up with the new tools and new techniques that we've discovered to create alignment in the organization. That doesn't get you anywhere. You've really got to find a way, and this is where you can tweak your heuristics, find a way to be able to latch onto those strategic outcomes. So what, they call a goal an objective and it should be an, uh, an, a, a goal in your eyes and an objective in your eyes and they haven't defined strategies properly and they're not they're not aligning correctly to what you consider to be a goal and they consider to be an obje objective. Those are battles you don't want to fight. Uh, who cares? You, you want to be able to produce the value. So start to leverage um, the investment that have already been put into some of those strategic planning spaces. Then also, this one here, and I've got two more slides and then we'll end there. <coughs> um, this one here is, I looked at the different framework. So actually, let me go back one slide just to introduce this so you have an understanding. If you recall in the beginning, I introduced this utility um, layer, innovate, assemble, and mix sort of space, and really what's going to differentiate you as an individual from other people that are in the space is your ability to innovate a single mix. Um, and the challenge here though is that you still need the utility layer. In order to produce fantastic Lego airplanes and cars, uh, I still need the utility building blocks to be able to work with. Well, that down in that layer we have a bunch of really, really good frameworks that you can work with. Um, and this little diagram takes a stab. It's my own personal view by the way. It's, it probably requires a little bit of an update. Uh, it really takes a stab at well what parts of which frameworks are good for what. And what you've got is you've got the BABOC, which is the business analysis body of knowledge, and you've got the BISBOC, which is the business architecture body of knowledge, and then you've got the TOGAF, which is the enterprise architecture framework. You know. And they all have various strengths in different places. And, and that, as, as an individual, you need to equip yourself and have an understanding, I think, of all of those frameworks. Because what makes you better, as I've said, is your ability to mix. And mixing as an architect is even mixing the tools and techniques that you can use to solve different problems. And you know the old saying, a fool with a tool is still a fool. Um, so, you know, 
you don't have to stick rigidly to these frameworks. And what makes you good at your job is being able to adapt them accordingly. So you can see and having a look through this, just different areas of where the strengths and weaknesses apply. And I won't go through that in detail just from a time, time perspective. But you know, one of the pieces I did want to latch onto was just, you know, yes, you know, we, we, we do do a lot of TOGAF training. Uh, we believe quite strongly <coughs> that what's missing is the glue that sticks it all together. So you've got all these frameworks, you've got all these techniques, but what often is the case is, is, is from the market model down to products and services, down to operating, there's a glue that we need to link it all together. <coughs> and that's a piece that's often missing. And that's where an EA framework, and when I say EA, it's not a technical framework, it is an enterprise architecture framework, which involves together requirements management, business architecture, performance modeling, strategic architecture, strategic planning, and technology architecture, application architecture, brings all of those pieces together into one sort of cohesive approach. And it's valuable to begin to understand how all of those pieces fit together. Because ultimately, the, the value comes in, in in stitching those disciplines together, not doing them in a silo, because that's what ultimately architecture is for. Don't, don't do business architecture in a silo. The whole point is to try and actually you know, understand how the artifacts that you produce can be used downstream for the application architects. It's to understand the types of input that, that you require from strategic planning and how they align. You've got to operate outside of that particular discipline. Now there's a few more slides here, which I'll, I'll, I'll distribute to you all on, on slides here so you can have a look at it. just more looking at a method, um, using the TOGAF method. Um, I just want to settle on this one, which is really looking at the hard and sort of soft skills space. Um, and you can see that the value increases as you kind of move up this curve and your skills mature. But you do get to a point in which, you know, there's only so many tools you can learn. You know, and they're all available on the internet. It's not going to make you a better architect. It doesn't make you being able to mix it better. You've got to get out in there and you've got to interact with your stakeholders to understand their problems and be able to use these tools more effectively. And that's a lot of the sort of coaching for soft skills space. So you, so you go through a journey here in which you learn baseline skills, and that's a lot of the, the courses that we teach. And then you go up in this coaching sort of space here. And, and for those of you who are interested in coaching and mentoring, you can get in touch with us as well. Which is really all about how can somebody come beside me and help me through the process of delivering the, the types of outcomes, because that's often the value in life. So let me finish off again just with a reminder that we do have a accelerated uh, course within the IABA um, development day occurring in Melbourne um, I'll be teaching uh, this in the, in the morning class um, on some of these tools and techniques and in the afternoon as well so you can either make the morning or the afternoon be able to um, see if you can come interact with the, the team there, interact with myself, as we can hopefully give you some of the, uh, the techniques that I've referred to today. We've got the uh, IBA endorsement or watch the space, so basically doing any of the business architecture courses with us, or specifically our applied business architecture, gets you an, uh, a discount and also gives you some credits towards your IBA certification. Um, there's a few other areas that we're involved in, in Fort Lauderdale, the BBC conference building business capability and then also there's a webinar next week which I'm doing on the value of the architecture practice. 